It's small and runs Windows 98. What a novel little thing. This is a Toshiba Libretto FF1100V UMPC laptop computer. Hello, this is Lengai64 and I'll be taking a look at this Toshiba Libretto FF1100V UMPC laptop computer which I somehow managed to get hold of somehow uh, for very little money by the way and uh, I think this can still be called a laptop computer because UMPC is smaller than a sub notebook or a netbook for that matter and if you got a problem with my use of terms then you're probably better off watching a, another channel that's hopefully better than mine or maybe watch hentai that's always a good thing but anyway um, getting this video together was a huge pain in the ass because of many factors getting in the way uh, in, regards of the, in regards to getting this video made uh, which I'll get into detail by in the post video ramble about so yeah um, not much point uh, rambling about the subject on hand uh, in front of the standing around here in front of the camera so I'll get on to it The first thing you'll notice is it looks absolutely tiny for a laptop computer from 1998 and this particular model of libretto is the last of what I classify as a classic libretto as models that came immediately after this featured a larger form factor more akin to a sub notebook and uses those weird Transmeta Crusoe processors and I imagine they're kinda shit really. Whilst this isn't only a UMPC laptop of its kind with HP's Omnibook line being one of its contemporaries and several libretto models introduced since its first inception in 1996 starting with the libretto 20 which is basically a little 486 laptop that is no bigger than a medium sized book and featured a color active matrix LCD screen this is certainly no small feat to achieve at the time as things haven't really become integrated enough to accomplish such a feat yet and would no doubt be expensive to produce with the technology available at the time the model I've somehow got hold of is the Libretto FF1100V and unlike its predecessors which featured a generally utilitarian business machine look with a grey color scheme and lightly textured surfaces, the FF1100V features a tacky silver paint, stupid curved edges and transparent plastics that was starting to become a horrible design trend by the turn of the century and one can easily pass this one off as one of those crappy armor MIPS based netbooks that ran Windows CE just by appearance when passing one on a shelf or glass case with the lid closed. The shitty design isn't too annoying on this one, but I personally prefer the original utilitarian look of the previous models. At least it's pretty easy to crack open for servicing. There are two variations of this model, the original FF1100 and the FF1100V. The only difference between the two is the V model features a larger 6.4GB hard drive, whereas the original non-V model features a 3.2GB drive everything else on the system is pretty much the same the hard drive of this laptop is still original and it even has the original OEM install of Windows 98 second edition still in it naturally I've made a backup image of the drive in case it fails or I accidentally installed something stupid that seriously fucks up the installation which did happen to me one time I may replace it with a compact flash card for slightly increased capacity and longer battery life in the future but I can live with a mechanical spinner for now as long as it still works if you've never heard of these models, I can't blame you as these were only released in Japan for whatever reason. Another case of Japan always getting the cool shit that the rest of the world had to miss out on. Looking around the thing, there's the usual laptop features of the time, such as the obligatory power supply connector with engraving showing the polarity and voltage rating, and a card bus card slot. Card bus and PCMCIA were the only real means of expansion for laptops from this time and there were all sorts of cards made for this interface ranging from hard cards, modems, network interface cards, and even sound cards. I much prefer this interface for adding additional storage to a laptop as hard cards usually remain flush to the laptop's body whereas with a modern day laptop you'll have USB sticks sticking out the or external hard drives hanging off the thing quite clumsily unless the laptop provides an option to add a second hard drive internally like my Dell right here. 
At the back, there's an IRDA port used for exchanging data with IRDA-enabled devices like PDAs or other computers with IRDA interfaces. Transferring files across this interface is like transferring files across a null modem serial cable, which is actually not that far off of how this interface works. It's basically serial with infrared pulses instead, or to some degree at least. Look at the speed and the power of infrared! Look at that! Whoa! 4 megabits per second! Whoa! It's so fast, it's slow! Then there's a USB 1.1 port, which during the 90s, there weren't a lot of things being made for this interface yet, despite many PCs and motherboards offering USB 1.1 and in some cases 1.0 during the mid 90s. USB input devices such as USB mice and gamepads will work on here, and with appropriate drivers, USB storage devices like my Magneto optical drive can also work. What's kinda neat about the USB implementation on this laptop is that the BIOS can actually boot from USB floppy drives, and this is a laptop from 1998. I don't know of any other laptop from this time that are capable of doing this. There will be other computers that can also do it certainly, but booting from a USB device was generally not yet a thing on many systems at this time. There are also 3.5mm jacks for headphones and a microphone input. Things you definitely won't see on a shiny new MacBook or iPhone. Following that is a little vent, which draws cooler air from the outside using a tiny cooling fan. There are no vents for hot air to vent out of though, which can be a bit of a problem sometimes, thermals wise. And finally, an external monitor port, which uses a VHDI looking terminal, requiring the use of an adapter that would originally come with this laptop to actually hook up a VGA monitor to this thing. Mine didn't come with such an adapter, so I'll be filming things running on the libretto from the screen like it's 2006 again, or a game prototype collector hoarder lazily showing off a prototype. To the right, there is this little proprietary port labeled remote. This port is where a special dongle that would originally come bundled with this laptop called the iShuttle would connect to. Despite something like an Apple product, this dongle would provide a headphone jack, media controls, and an LCD screen to show track information and such. So the libretto can be used sort of like a makeshift portable MP3 player, where the libretto would be stowed away in a bag and this dongle would run out of it, so it would look like you have a little MP3 player on your shirt or something. Mine didn't come with said dongle either, so I won't be able to demonstrate that capability unfortunately. Would have been quite novel to demonstrate personally. Oh, that page you just saw earlier? Well, that and its accompanying specs page are gone now because fuck you Toshiba. This domain used to work by the way, but it just takes you to the usual not found page. Figures, because they've since bowed out of the computer market not that long ago, probably because their computer division has turned to shit like everything else today. Haven't checked if it's on the internet archive, but it won't surprise me if it isn't on there. I've said it before and I'll say it again, everything on the internet is temporary, whether it be information or people. Assuming people on the internet can still be considered people. I don't. Following that is the reset button, recessed in a hole such that it cannot be pressed by accident and a smart ass media card slot supporting 3.3 volt and 5 volt card types. I don't have one of those cards to show one being inserted however. Hey Mr. Script Reader, look what I got. I guess you're a bit out of touch with things as of late. Well that guy sure is right. Mm, what a douchebag. Finally, there's also a modem port the door of which doubles as part of an RJ11 jack once opened. Not a useful feature anymore as most ISPs don't offer dial-up services anymore with copper phone lines being phased out. Though I imagine it was quite useful in its time for quickly getting on the internet as long as you have access to a phone line. There's no point going online on these things anyway as the modern internet generally doesn't play ball with old web browsers. Well, except my website of course as I'm not dickish enough to add needless bells and whistles or use HTTPS. Only assholes use HTTPS on their websites, especially when there's no message board or anything where information can be submitted to in the first place. I still network my old computers, including this libretto for transferring files around systems across the network, because I'm fancy like that. And these systems are connected to a network that has internet access by the way, as I can't be bothered to set up a separate network for these systems. You've got a problem with this practice? 
You must be the problem. And you're probably one of those weirdos who hide MAC addresses too for whatever strange reason. Oh, and my internet provider's router is a Huawei device. And if you got a problem with that, then haha. There isn't much on the bottom of the laptop, apart from the information sticker, which would just be a smudge if this were on Wikipedia, and this little cover for installing a 64 megabyte memory expansion module, which adds to the 64 megabytes already included in a laptop. I don't have this memory expansion module, nor would I need one as 64 megabytes is already plenty for Windows 98 anyway. There also isn't much on the top of the laptop either, apart from the two mouse buttons and the libretto logo is oriented such that it'll appear upside down with the lid open. So you'll be having a hard time impressing people with the libretto you've just spent a lot of your hard earned yens on as a result. As you can probably tell by now, the battery pack which fits in the front of the laptop has clearly been fucked with. Well, I did fuck with it because fuck having a laptop without a working battery. I've already had enough of dealing with those damn things during my college years and I don't want to look stupid having to tether my laptop to the wall constantly just to use the bloody thing. Fortunately, rebuilding a libretto battery pack is fairly trivial as, unlike later laptop batteries that feature more sophisticated management circuitry that usually prevents rebuilding, which I usually call smartass packs. No! No! The Libretto's battery pack doesn't have such asshole measures and simply replacing the battery cells is enough to bring a dead Libretto battery back to life. I can't be certain if this will work on all Libretto battery packs from the 90s however. The pack is meant to take the smaller 17670 cells but I'm using 18650s in the meantime, hence why it doesn't have its cover back on. I have working 17670s on hand but I need my dad's spot welder to assemble it properly. But well, the spot welder is busted largely as it's a Chinaland piece of shit as usual. Thanks for the made in China flu by the way. Opening the lid, you're greeted with a 7.1 inch color TFT display with a native resolution of 800 by 40 pixels and it is active matrix. It has a pretty decent contrast ratio for a panel from the late 90s, albeit a bit on the yellow side due to age, and is also quite a responsive display panel possibly rivaling and sometimes surpassing many modern oversized calculator panel monitors. Active Matrix TFT panels were already around for quite some time by this point. They just weren't very common yet because they were a lot more expensive than Passive Matrix DSTN panels. This pervy computer PC9821LT right here, which would have been relevant somewhere around the mid 90s, has an Active Matrix TFT screen. It actually looked quite decent and the display response time was actually good enough for Toho 4 to be playable on it. Well, when this pervy pewter used to work. Whilst the screen on this laptop is definitely 16x10, having a wide screen on a laptop wasn't exactly new at this time, as many early laptops from the late 80s that only offered CGA graphics often had rectangular screens such as this beat to shit Dynabook 286 which resemble those early 80 column text terminals that have wide CRT screens. The way how the display panel updates the screen seems to be interlaced at 120Hz, but the panel itself is full 480 lines, as the display tends to exhibit combing like artifacts on flashing or rapidly moving picture elements, which I can't really show very well with the cameras I'm using, but they're only visible very briefly and it only becomes apparent with certain colors namely between full black and full white, so there's a good chance you won't really notice these artifacts. It displays Zeos just fine though. Well, most of your attention since the very start of this video is probably drawn by this thing right here. Yeah, this is indeed a digital camera, and this libretto is probably one of the earliest laptops to feature such a thing as having a digital camera on a laptop was a completely unheard of thing at this time and it wasn't until around the mid to late 2000s when companies started incorporating such things into laptops only for morons to put tape over them. Though video conferencing over the internet has been around since the 90s with one of the more common examples being Microsoft NetMeeting. In fact, this camera would actually work in NetMeeting if it were actually working. Yeah, sorry to disappoint but the camera in this thing actually came broken when I got it. But fortunately, there was a picture and a video clip that was taken using this camera that was left in the hard drive, so we can at least get a rough idea of what the picture and video quality on it was like. It's not too dissimilar to those cheap webcams from the 2000s with a manual focus dial, 
which wasn't adjusted properly in these shots. Hence why it looks so blurry and it's not some shit tier editor who uses smudge filters and 1 kilohertz tones doing his job. I don't hire such assholes in my workforce. Uh, actually, I don't hire anybody in this workplace. Seriously though, be considerate to assholes, you assholes. The camera has a focal length of 4.56 millimeters using a CMOS sensor with a resolution of 350,000 pixels. The camera is attached on a swivel so it can be adjusted to either point at your ugly mug or point away so it can be used like a more conventional digital camera. And it can be removed entirely from the laptop itself which may satisfy paranoid Nancy boys but an extension cable would be supplied that would connect between the two so the camera can be used somewhat separately from the laptop. Among the things around the bezel is the obligatory Windows 98 and Windows NT sticker as well as a sticker denoting that it features an Intel Pentium MMX processor. This is not exactly like the Pentium MMX you'll find on Socket 7 systems which are based on a P55C core. The one in this libretto is based on a Tillamook derivative of it which is basically a shrunk down P55C and rated to run at higher clocks than the Socket 7 Pentium MMX chips which only topped at 233 MHz. The particular one in this libretto is rated at 266 MHz as it runs on a 66 MHz bus with a 4 times multiplier. It gets quite toasty though so be prepared to hear the fan running at full pelt a lot when running games on this thing. Along the top right edge of the laptop are some status lights to indicate charger, power, battery and hard disk activity respectively and are shaped in such a way that they are still visible from the edge with the lid closed. The power indicator would fade in and out when the laptop is on standby and the battery indicator would glow red when charging which will eventually turn green once full. Moving down there is a power button that's recessed in an indentation so it doesn't get pushed when the lid gets closed followed by this little nub which serves as a pointing stick for this device with the mouse buttons on the back side of the lid. It's fairly comfortable to use whilst gripping the laptop from the edge, but it's quite awkward to use when the laptop's on a table as I can't adjust my thumbs at a comfortable angle like this. Along the hinge of the lid is a little condenser microphone, which is actually pretty decent recording quality wise. I'll record the next paragraph using it to hear what the quality is like. Below the mic on the bottom half of the laptop is the snap button, which acts as a shortcut key for the live media camera application and as a shutter button if the camera on this thing were actually working. On the left is the teeny little speaker which is completely incapable of reproducing any low frequencies whatsoever so you better use headphones if you want to listen to music properly on this thing. The only real annoyance I have about the speaker is there's no physical volume control whatsoever so the only way to adjust the volume is by software which is entirely software dependent in pure DOS as the laptop doesn't have a DOS mixer included. Next to that speaker is the lid switch, which doesn't really work anymore thanks to damage done by a certain old friend that anyone who's worked with really old computers would be familiar of. As per usual with Japanese computers, the laptop features a standard OEDG106 keyboard. It works with non-Japanese software just fine, but expect keys to not line up with what's actually being registered, particularly the symbols along the row of number keys among others. This is less of an issue with Windows applications however as the operating system handles keyboard mapping for applications automatically. The keys themselves are quite small so good luck trying to use it if you have massive sausage fingers. It gets pretty tiring when typing extensively on this thing even with my frail little Asian fingers. Naturally this makes playing certain games pretty awkward, namely build engine games such as Duke Nukem 3D or Shadow Warrior to name a few. But these can be remedied by redefining the controls to a layout that's more comfortable to play with on this laptop. Platformer games are also affected by this too, but I find using the FN numeric keypad instead of the cursor keys to be much more comfortable. Using a USB controller is always an option, but it'll only work when running under Windows and you're still limited to 2 button or 4 button input for MS-DOS games. Thanks to my crafty abilities with tools and electronics, I'm going to crack this libretto open to make collector hoarders weep and to show how densely packed this thing is inside. This thing is actually relatively easy to take apart for such a small thing. Simply remove all screws at the bottom of the laptop and remove this strip of plastic above the keyboard to release it. 
Carefully lift the keyboard off the laptop as there is a ribbon cable underneath that needs to be disconnected. Disconnect this cable that goes to the lid of the laptop and after releasing some clips, the top half of the laptop will come off with ease. Everything that runs this laptop is more or less condensed on this one board and damn it's quite jam packed. It can probably even be considered a single board computer by this point, or at least technically. The hard drive is fortunately just a standard 2.5 inch Toshiba drive and not some proprietary nonsense like this weird 1.8 inch drive in my ThinkPad X40 as that would be a lot harder to replace if the libretto came with a missing or dead hard drive, unless you go with compact flash of course. The laptop features a Yamaha YMF715F as the audio codec, which is basically a YMF711 with 3D audio capability tacked on from what little I've read. This chip is most likely wired to an internal ISA bus as the YMF715 is an ISA audio codec, which would explain why it works with DOS games without needing a driver. So games like Zone 66 will run complete with ad-lib fart maker and noise blaster sounds on this thing. Heck, you can even configure the audio codex resources in the BIOS. Wait a minute, DOS games? That's right, this thing can run all your favorite Western MS DOS games with ease as unlike some other Japanese computers like the NEC Pervy Computer 98 series and the Sharp X68000, this libretto is effectively an IBM compatible PC which Toshiba more or less stuck with instead of making their own OEM specific nonsense that will only really serve to make the personal computer space in Japan even more fragmented. Systems like this are dubbed as DOS V compatible systems in the land of the rising sun. The processor, chipset, and Neomagic graphics live underneath this piece of shielding which doubles as a heatsink for the CPU. I don't really want to take this shielding off however as I don't really want to risk breaking this laptop in doing so. I have my limits. Hey 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 Mr. Narrator guy, that's the pussy's way out. Ugh, that fucking cheeky bastard. Man, they're quite on the ball with integration on this area of the board especially the spacing between the Neod Magic chip and the Toshiba chip next to it. That is quite tight and this board would no doubt be expensive to produce just by how dense and tightly packed the components and traces on this thing are. The packaging on that main Toshiba chipset looks quite neat and I've never seen quite like it before. Looks to be a BGA mounted part judging by the lack of legs around the chip. That chip to the right of it is the Tillamook Penium MMX 266 itself, model number SL23M and it also comes in an interesting looking package. That isn't a die on the middle, that seems to be like a chip on blob embedded into an interposer which is mounted to the board like a PQFP chip. I like how it has a plastic surround on it, maybe it's to help protect the pins or to prevent heat from other parts coming into it somehow. The laptop features a Neomagic Magic Graph 128XT video chip with 4 megabytes of video memory which is also used in many other laptops such as IBM ThinkPads, particularly the 600E. I find them to be kinda slow for software rendering stuff, particularly when playing Jazz Jack Rabbit 2 as I remember it running somewhat poorly on the 600E I had, and that one featured a Pentium 2. But it has some video acceleration capability by means of hardware pixel format conversion and scaling when playing MPEG videos and such. It also provides Visa 2.0 support that compatible DOS games can make use of. With no external monitor attached, the video chip can be set to higher resolutions on a technicality where a larger desktop resolution can be achieved but the screen would still display in its native resolution of 800 by 480 pixels acting as a viewport, showing a portion of the larger desktop which you can scroll around with the mouse. For whatever reason, Duke Nukem 3D always crashes when trying to run the game in SVGA mode even with the no LFB TSR loaded to roll out a buggy Visa linear frame buffer implementation. Don't remember if it would also do the same thing on a ThinkPad with the same Neomagic graphics. Meanwhile Quack would run fine in SVGA mode on this and I can even select the screen's native resolution. Looks kinda neat as far as poopy brown colors go. Runs pretty shit though. I can't seem to find any memory chips around this thing, though I imagine they're underneath the PCI slot which I cannot really get to, but I can just about make out what might be a memory chip from this angle right here. 
Remember what I was saying about a certain old friend earlier? Well, that old friend is Varta, and if you have a Toshiba libretto like what I have, you may want to deal with Varta before that bastard destroys your libretto's motherboard with corrosive juices, if it hasn't already. And you can't just leave the laptop running without a working battery to take its place, as the laptop would start behaving like shit otherwise, even with a working battery pack installed. Or that's what I found. Bodging a 3 volt coin cell and a diode into it should do the trick. Alright, enough gawking at the hardware, time to fire this bitch up! Naturally, being a laptop from 1998, it runs Windows 98 Second Edition, and this is still the original install as it came when this laptop was bought brand new back in the day. Toshiba would offer to pre-install Windows NT 4.0 or 95 instead if preferred. It comes bundled with a bunch of software ranging from Toshiba's own utilities and their so-called live media suite to various multimedia and information related software packages. The Toshiba Utilities includes a system configuration applet for changing some settings in the BIOS without having to go into the BIOS menu, and this rather comprehensive power management applet that basically lets you tweak almost everything on the laptop, from processor clock to brightness level all the way up to outright disabling power to some peripherals such as USB and PCMCIA to further save on energy. It also draws out a graph over time to visualize the rate of discharge of the battery. I haven't seen any other laptop having this level of depth in regards to conserving power. The settings made here can be saved as a profile, which can be loaded quickly via context menu by right clicking the power icon in the system tray, or with a keyboard combination for quickly switching between profiles based on your workload. The battery warning can be customized to trigger at a specified battery level, and a custom sound file can be set to play when the battery reaches a low battery threshold. Oh yeah? Now for the live media stuff. It includes a photo and video applet that would work with a camera if it was working, a media player that would work with the iShuttle dongle if I have one, has playlist functionality and can read some metadata information, so at least it has that going for over Windows 98's media player. The details shown would be relayed to the iShuttle screen if it was connected. There's also a fairly simple sound recorder that can record for as long as there's disk space available, and indexes can be placed within large recordings so the libretto can be used like an IC recorder. It's time to kick bubblegum and chew ass, but I'm all out of ass. A very basic video editor that's very clunky to use as it doesn't let you preview the timeline, and this stupid gimmicky thing called music dance that has these horrid looking 3D figures dancing around at a slideshow rate. Judging by how it has a camera button on it, I imagine you're supposed to take a picture of your mug with this, which this stupid program would then plaster onto those models. But since the camera doesn't work and there doesn't seem to be an option to use an image file, I can't stick my stupid Asian mug on here. Reminds me a bit of that Face Raiders game that comes bundled with a 3DS. There's also Toshiba's Onsei Sisutomo, which is basically a speech synthesis thing mainly for providing voice assisted accessibility. While I don't condone the use of speech synthesis, particularly when used as shitty narration for a video because cowardice, this ain't half bad for a speech engine from the late 90s. Here, take a listen. Or how about this? And yes, the Japanese is supposed to be kuso. It also has a speech recognition thing judging by how this applet would access the mic, but I can't seem to get it to work. Either I haven't configured it yet with recorded directives, or I'm not pretending to be Japanese hard enough. <laughs> Toshiba also included a Yamaha Soft XG synthesizer for whatever reason, even though this thing doesn't have the horsepower to run it at high quality without the system locking up almost completely. Horrible software synthesizer! Horrible, horrible, horrible! This thing is about as fast as a Pentium 60! As for the other bundled applications, there's Hot Shots, which looks to be a photo management tool with some limited editing capability. 
Video Brush Panorama, which generates panoramic images from video clips, which actually looks pretty interesting. Why don't I try my own clips on this program? Well, this is going to take a while as I'm stuffing some DV video in an AVI container into it. And it appears to have worked. Surprisingly well in fact, given the age of this program. Resolution is kinda shit though. Probably because it decoded the DV video at half resolution. But I can't imagine how long it would take to process full resolution video on this libretto. But the panorama itself turned out pretty good. Definitely a neat piece of software to have on this thing. If the camera was working. Temprider Express appears to be a template based label designer for making all sorts of labels for various media formats. Though I don't know how you're supposed to hook up a printer to this thing unless Japan already has USB inkjet printers by 1998. Proto Atorasu 2000, which is a map thing akin to Google Maps, and is probably not very useful anymore as the map data is certainly long out of date by this point, and a lot would have changed by then. There's a bunch more stuff that's been included with this thing, along with some stuff the previous owner had installed as well. But I'd be here all day if I were to cover everything, which wouldn't really make for a very interesting video, let's be honest. So instead, I'll jump straight to running DOS and some Windows games on this thing, as that's what most people usually do with these old things anyway. Because games. Jazz Jack Rabbit 2 runs pretty well on this thing, as long as it's running in hardware mode. It gets quite slow in running without it, and even slower with ambient lighting enabled think this might be why I remember it not running so well on the ThinkPad I had all those years ago. But because of the cramped placement of the arrow keys and the game behaving a bit weird with the FN numeric keypad, it is best to play this game with a gamepad. On the other hand, my 233MHz Pentium MMX with an S3 Verge runs this game a bit more smoothly. Even my 180MHz Pentium Noob workstation with a Matrox Millennium card at my place of work can run this game at roughly this level of performance despite being 53MHz slower and lacks MMX instructions. Both systems were running the game in hardware mode by the way. Win Quack would also run on here, and I imagine Quack 2 would as well in software rendering mode. Trouble is, there's no CD-ROM drive on this libretto, and I don't have a PCMCIA CD-ROM drive on hand, so I can't really show Quack 2 running on here. I could probably get around it with daemon tools, but if this thing can run win quack, I don't see how quack 2 won't run on this thing. <laughs> As for DOS games, the Yamaha Ymetzer 15F audio codec provides a mostly trouble free experience in regards to Sound Blaster Pro 2.0 compatibility. As well as a genuine Yamaha OPL3 fart maker synthesizer integrated in the chip. Though it might be based on the YMF289 core instead of the 262 but it seems indistinguishable from what I can tell personally. And since it has a real OPL3, I guess you can do ad-lib tracking on this thing while you're out and about. Honestly can't bring myself to compose on trackers worth shit nowadays. And since the YMF715F would work without needing a driver, the few DOS games that would bitch about having any drivers loaded like Zone 66 and some Ultima game I can't remember the name of will also work. Though I have to boot from a DOS floppy as the Japanese MS-DOS in this Windows 98 install would still load something I can't figure out how to disable, even with a config sys and auto execute that bat files completely blanked out. And speaking of which, you may want to comment out all Japanese related drivers in the config sys file as said drivers would change the way how text mode would behave on this thing, so it can display Japanese characters, which would most certainly break text mode interfaces like setup menus and such that aren't DOS V aware. 
DOS compatibility isn't perfect, however. Duke Two would eventually stop playing digitized sound effects after a while in pure DOS mode, though this is somewhat remedied by running the game under Windows. Star Gunner would run, but the timer seems to be going a bit nuts judging by how fast the intro cutscene and the menus run at, though the game would crash as soon as you start the level. Rise of the Triad would crash during the Apogee fanfare animation, which can be avoided by skipping it, but the game will crash anyway when loading a level, even in pure DOS mode. Seek and Destroy would start, sound would work, looks pretty because it runs in 320x240 mode, and the border color fills the rest of the screen, but it crashes as soon as you dare try to attack anything. At least the build engine games like Duke Nukem 3D, Shadow Warrior, and Blood would run on it, albeit without the SVJ modes as the game would crash in doing so, as I've said earlier. Doom Engine games would also run fine on here, but I don't know about how the later Doom Engine games like Hexen or Strife would run on here, as they don't have those games on hand. Terminal Velocity also runs fine on here, and SVJ mode works in this game as well. Doesn't quite perform as well as my 233 MHz Pentium MMX when running in the same video mode. Well, it might seem unfair as this is a portable device to start with and such things are usually geared towards energy efficiency over performance in its design. But regardless, I'm going to pit it against the closest desktop equivalent of the libretto I have, my 233 MHz Pentium MMX system, sporting a PC Chips M537 motherboard based on the VIA VT82C580 VX Noob chipsets, with fire 12 kilobytes of level 2 cache on board, 64 megabytes of 60 nanosecond EDO memory, and an S3 Verge DX with 4 megabytes of video memory. As I mentioned earlier, Intel never produced a Socket 7 Pentium MMX chip clocked beyond 233 MHz, likely so it won't eat into their celeries as the Pentium MMX can quite easily outperform a celery clock for clock, largely as it has cache memory to work with. AMD did make a Socket 7 chip clocked beyond 233 MHz in the form of the K6 and Cyrix would then follow with an M2266GP, but I don't think those really count as they don't actually run at 266MHz. For fun, I'll include benchmark results from a 266MHz K62 system that I've quickly cobbled together for the sake of this video, using an Asus SP97V motherboard based on the Sys5598 chipset with 512KB of level 2 cache as provided by the motherboard, 64 megabytes of 60 nanosecond EDO memory, and the same S3 Verge from the Pentium MMX in an attempt to keep a level playing field somewhat, just to see how AMD's answer to a 266MHz socket 7 chip compares to an equivalently clocked Tillamook. I can't stuff the K6 into the Pentium MMX rig as the M537 only tops out at 3 times multiplier, and I need the 4 times multiplier to run a K62 at 266MHz. And before you ask, I know I'm using a K62350 here, as I don't have a K6 chip rated that low. But K6s generally don't mind being underclocked like this, making them somewhat versatile chips. It shouldn't make much of a difference, as the only real difference between the original K6 and the K62 is a die shrink and support for 3D Now instructions, which none of the tests that I'll be running make use of. Though the K6 has some tricks up its sleeve that I'll get into detail during the benchmarks. As for the bio settings, I've set the libretto to a performance oriented cooling method to get the most performance out of the system under DOS mode, and it does maintain pretty consistent performance with this setting even with the fan sounding like a really shit hair dryer. I've also left the cache setting to write back mode which is the default on the bios. The other cache mode available is write through mode which I don't think would make much of a difference. Oddly, there is no pipeline burst mode, which is usually supported in P54 and P55C systems. Not sure if that's due to the Tillamook chips not supporting it, or it's the Toshiba chipset being a bit behind at this. On the Pentium MMX, most things are set to default, except for the memory timings, which I've set to 60 nanoseconds, and enabled fast DRAM decode. The latter I don't think makes much of a difference. The K6 has whatever defaults the ASUS board comes with. Alright, on with the benchmarks! In 3D Bench, the Pentium MMX comes in with 127.4 frames per second, 
and the libretto beats it with 148.2 frames per second. Off to a promising start for the libretto. So does that 33 MHz clock difference really make quite a difference? This is why I run multiple tests like any good enthusiast in this hobby would do. The K6 is just out there with 234.6 frames per second. There must be something really interesting going on with that chip as that's a pretty ridiculous result compared to the Intel equivalent clock for clock. Next up, PC Player. The Pentium MMX comes in with 52.4 frames per second and the libretto takes it again but only by a fraction with 52.6 frames per second in this test. The gap is wider in this VGA mode with the Pentium MMX coming in with 19.8 frames per second and the libretto with 23.2 frames per second in this test. I don't have any VBE TSR loaded or any TSR for that matter on both systems to keep a somewhat equal footing between them. The K6 is just off in the distance with 74.5 frames per second and 29.8 frames per second in SVGA mode. Again, why is this chip so fucking fast? At least compared to the equivalently clocked Intel chip. And the board it's on isn't even a Super Socket 7. It's a plain Socket 7 with only 72 pin dim slots and the bus clock settings only top out at 83 megahertz. But it's running with a 66 megahertz bus just like the Intel systems. In top bench, the Pinium MMX scores 298 points, whereas the Libretto scores 310 in this test. Notice how the timing results in the Libretto keep fluctuating to stupidly huge numbers for whatever reason. Could be subtle clock or bus throttling going on that's throwing off those tests. Though I've seen it do a similar thing on the K6 too at 400MHz on the same ASUS board I'm using for the K6 tests with a 66MHz bus and remapped 6x multiplier setting. But I didn't record footage of that in action sadly. The K6 tramples both systems big time with 391 points. In Doom, the Pentium MMX comes in with 1257 real ticks or about 59.41 frames per second. And for the first time in this series of benchmarks, the libretto is lagging behind with 1453 real ticks or about 51.4 frames per second. I guess that 33 MHz boost does not always work in all workloads, but we might see why once we get to speedsys. Both systems continue to eat dirt from the K6 coming in with 861 real ticks or about 86.74 frames per second. Oh, that's quite a ways ahead. In Quack, the Pinium MMX yields 41.2 frames per second and the libretto lags behind real bad with 32.2 frames per second in the usual demo 1 time demo. That is quite a gap all things considered and I doubt it's thermal throttling bringing it down. Actually, there is some throttling going on with the libretto as running a quack benchmark again with the laptop just cold booted yielded 41.2 frames per second from the 32.2 it had before. Though Doom didn't yield any improvement when I tested that again. Don't think it'd be worth rerunning all the tests that way as I think it would be more realistic for the laptop to keep throttling itself as it would when the laptop is used normally. I should stress that the throttling is considerably more aggressive when running under Windows than it is under pure DOS, even with a power profile set to the highest performance setting available. Observe how terminal velocity in SVGA mode performs under Windows than it is under MS-DOS. The latter still maintains roughly that level of performance even with the fan running at full pelt. Interestingly, the K6 doesn't yield much of a lead in quack, yielding 42.5 frames per second. Perhaps AMD's slower FPU is dragging it down a bit, which would make sense as Quack makes very heavy use of the floating point unit. In speed sys CPU test, the Pentium MMX scores 174.3 points, while the Libretto scores 199.5, nearly edging a Pentium Noob 200 and surpassing the Pentium MMX by a notable gap. Meanwhile, the K6 just pisses all over both systems like some water sports hentai with a whopping 304.66. That is just sick, man, considering that chip is running at 266 megahertz. In memory bandwidth, the Pinium MMX takes the lead with 220.82 megabytes per second. 
It's actually faster than the K6 which comes second with 167.84 megabytes per second. I should mention that I've turned off the onboard UMA VGA of the Asus SP97 motherboard with a jumper setting that the K6 is running on. Perhaps the VIA VX Noob set of chips has some pretty fast memory access, though it's a bit of a quirky chipset as it tends to throw a fit with certain hardware configurations. The libretto comes in last with 154.59 megabytes per second, and I believe this is why the tables turned between the Pentium MMX and the libretto in Doom and Quack, as rendering texture map floors and walls requires pretty fast memory bandwidth even more so with Quack as it additionally modulates textures against light maps. I don't know the speed at which the memory chips of the libretto are rated at, largely as I couldn't find them, but I imagine Toshiba placed conservative timings on things like what most bigger OEMs tended to do, as they often lean towards reliability over performance on their systems. It's possible it could be a power saving measure as well. Visa memory speed is pretty fast on the Pentium MMX with the S3 Verge, coming in with 23.43 megabytes per second, while the libretto and its Neomagic graphics is not too far behind with 20.66 megabytes per second. Visa memory speed is fastest on the K6 with 24.03 megabytes per second using the same S3 Verge from the Pentium MMX. In level 1 cache, the Pentium MMX comes in with 416.7 megabytes per second, while the Libby Reto gets around 473.94 megabytes per second, which is the part as the level 1 cache is integrated within the CPU and runs at its internal clock speed. Though I'm not entirely sure on the Libby Reto, as I'm told Tillamooks don't have integrated level 1 cache, but there's both level 1 and level 2 cache on the system. The K6 comes in with 1.2, uh, let me fix that. Yeah, the K6 comes in with 1.2 gigabytes per second. That is absolutely ridiculous for a socket 7 chip in all honesty, and that's the party trick of the K6 I've been waffling on about earlier. That's also 32 kilobytes of cache, and there's two level 1 caches on the K6 as well. Another notable aspect about the K6 is it employs the RISC-86 principle of code execution where the processor breaks down x86 sys instructions into smaller RISC instructions internally. In level 2 cache, the Benium MMX comes in with 169.46 megabytes per second, while the libretto comes second with 173.28. The K6 takes the lead with 210.82 megabytes per second. In memory throughput, the Pentium MMX comes in with 110.61 megabytes per second, while the libretto lags behind by only a tiny margin, with 109.39 megabytes per second. Interesting how both systems are nearly identical here, despite the slower memory bandwidth for the libretto. The K6 comes in last with 98.45 megabytes per second. It's possible the ASUS board and its SIS5598 chipset is letting it down somewhat. Overall, the libretto and its 266MHz Pentium MMX would be marginally faster than a 233MHz beige box on paper, but falls flat on real-world workloads as seen in Doom and Quack, likely held back by various factors introduced by the libretto itself, which is not helped by the lack of pipeline burst mode and thermal issues due to inadequate cooling, which is a bit of a shame. Though I have a feeling the 5th generation Pentium was already at capacity by this point, or is at the very least getting there, as the Tillamook Pentium MMX only topped out at 300MHz officially. Whilst this libretto turned out to be a bit lacking in performance, I do not discredit the sheer novelty of the laptop itself just by having a digital camera and the remote dongle thing to use it as a portable media player of sorts. Clearly, Toshiba wanted to make this a portable all-in-one multimedia solution that can also get onto the internet, which was a shiny new thing at the time, in a package no bigger than a medium-sized book in an attempt to make a cutting-edge product, which this thing would be considered as one back in the day. Anyway, I think that's about it for this part of the video, so back to that rather irritating twerp in front of the camera. And there you have it, that's uh, the Toshiba Libretto FF1100V, more or less covered, 
or at least with the best of my abilities. Uh, hopefully I did a much better job at covering this thing than some of the bigger channels who just be like, oh look at this, this is like a Toshiba Libretto, it's from like 1998, look at how small it is, it's like ridiculous for like 1998. Look, it's got a widescreen, it runs Windows 98, it runs games and games and games and games. Uh, please pay to my Patreon or whatever. Uh, I'm both. And uh, not actually go through the thing in detail, uh, especially no benchmarks because why would anyone want to know how, how this thing actually performs, right? Or worse, a video of this thing made by some silent type channel who just turn on the damn thing and run some games on it. Because people only care about games on old systems, right? So, yeah. Um, I think it's a good thing that this video took a long while to make because um, I would have otherwise uh, I would have uh, not been able to cover some oddities of uh, uh, or details about the thing. Uh, otherwise, if I made this video sooner, like uh, my original benchmark figures for this uh, la uh, for the libretto were actually worse than. Uh, what I've shown in this video uh, because it, it turns out you have to set the cooling method to like performance if you leave it to quiet uh, in the BIOS it will perform like a Pentium 133 if not worse in pure DOS so oh um, so yeah um, you gotta set uh, it to performance which will make the thing sound like a hair dryer uh, most of the time when running MS DOS on it or M playing MS DOS games on it um, I should stress that the thermal throttling of this libretto is more aggressive when you're in Windows than it is under pure DOS. Even if you have like set the power profiles to like burn through the battery max performance in the power uh, power applet uh, on our power power control thing in the uh, in Windows 98, even if you set those, it would still throttle way harder in when we're trying to play games. Uh, Try to when trying to play games when trying to play games on in under Windows in a DOS box than it is under pure DOS. Uh, and look at that some of the footage of terminal velocity when I showed it running under Windows to demonstrate like the USB controllers working with MS DOS games, which does actually work. Uh, notice how it runs in a slideshow rate, and if I run the game again but in pure DOS and also running in the same SVJ mode. Um, it runs a lot smoother, even when the fan is like uh, running at full full speed. It, it still runs uh, about the, uh, at a much better frame rate, really. It's a shame the camera of my libretto is uh, broken, uh, even uh, whilst it's like a pretty mediocre camera. Uh, no, actually, it's not too bad because this is 1998. Digital cameras weren't really a thing yet, and it would have probably cost a lot more than the, uh, as much, if not more, than this libretto. I could not find any pri uh, prices of how much this thing would have retailed at, unfortunately. Uh, not even on the specs page on Toshiba's website that is lo long gone now because fuck you Toshiba. So, yeah, um, it, it's pretty pointless now because, well, we have um, much better cameras now, but it'd be quite novel to have it working in the libretto, really, because uh, uh, cameras and laptops weren't really a thing yet on lap on computers in 1998 and well video capture hardware was starting to take off like BT848s and 878s were starting to become increasingly popular by then but they're still niche they're still not very common or abundant rather so yeah um i think uh, i don't know the i, I think this uh, libretto uh, clearly uh, it seems to be trying to be it seems to try at being being uh, like an all-in-one uh, multimedia solution uh, but it seems to come off as some kind of a jack-of-all-trades master of none type thing because while well, it's digital camera is not well it's not even a megapixel 
but uh, well, early consumer cameras at the time were also like that too, uh, the early digital cameras. But uh, you could do more with the libretto, like you could use it like an MP3 player, albeit a bulky one. But I imagine there were also MP3 players that uh, also operated in a similar manner, uh, particularly the larger ones that are like as big as a 3.5 inch hard drive enclosure. Uh, that actually has a hard disk inside. I imagine it, it would also have like a little dongle that would run out, so you could like just keep the thing in your bag and then have the dongle run out, so you could like plug in your he headset into it or and controlling it, control it remotely without having to dig it out of your bag. I, I imagine it's not, it's pretty good at that, uh, as I imagine, uh, especially in a time when most MP3 players at the time could only store like. Uh, tenths of megabytes and the ones that are of like and the high capacity ones are really expensive so and you can also use the libretto to like get on the internet and you, know, you could also it's, uh, because it which was uh, the internet was like a shiny new thing at the time so uh, you can also do like computer regular computer stuff on it uh, play games uh, play, uh, doing word processing and like for like typing your essay in college or some or high school whatever uh, if you're some kid from a rich family, I suppose. So, yeah, um, it's a bit of a shame the Tillamook Pinium MX in it wasn't uh, can't really keep up uh, with a 233 megahertz desktop system. Uh, in large part of the thermal throttling uh, bring it down, and I imagine other factors like the lack of pipeline burst cache uh, and. Uh, uh, it seems memory on it is also slower in general, um, but in this I don't know. But yeah, it's not as fast as a Pentium MX two thirty three. In most cases, it you can see the performance uh, when in like three D bench and PC player. But I suspect it's because it, they're small programs; they fit better in cache. So uh, the Telemo can hit a uh, higher. Uh, hit uh, higher speeds uh, when programs can easily fit in in uh, at least level 2 cache I imagine so I don't know it's uh, well, if you really want the 266 megahertz uh, socket 7 system uh, I don't think it would be worth it tr tr uh, going out of your way to try to find those uh, weird uh, uh, telemooks that have been adopted for socket 7s which are quite rare by the way I don't think it's worth getting those and it's better to just get the K6 because as you can see the K6 just, just tramples all over the Pinium MMX chips. Uh, I think in large part of it's ridiculous uh, level 1 cache speed and it has more cache to work with as well. Uh, level 1 cache in part, uh, to be exact. And also they're more they're more abundant. They're, uh, they're more common and uh, they're more also more compatible um, as well. Um, so yeah, it's better. It, it's just I think it's just better to get uh, K6 to K6 or K6 to running at 266 megahertz, if not faster. And with the faster ones, you could pair it with a Super Socket 7 board that has like AGP and then and, and uh, SD RAM uh, that runs at like 100 megahertz or so. So yeah, um, and also those so uh, Socket 7 adapted Tillamooks are not only rare and uh, also incompatible because well they're usually made by like fly-by-night companies because Intel doesn't want uh, their, two, their 266 megahertz chips for, to be on socket 7 because they want to push their celeries and the Tillamook was uh, really meant for uh, portable systems really um, I should men elaborate on the bat how the libretto uh, behaves with uh, when there's no CMOS battery in it uh, a bit, a bit it, it acts weird when there's no CMOS uh, battery in it that works. Uh, uh, not only do you get the usual, you, you have to re you have to set the CMOS every time you start it up, but uh, weird things happen. Like the backlight would often stop working. Uh, if there's no working CMOS battery, uh, which uh, threw me off uh, when I was like working on the thing because well I thought I broke it, uh, but uh, it seems. It uh, it seems uh, it just doesn't like to be run without the CMOS battery and then of course a uh, hibernation would stop working because uh, the flag that would tell the BIOS that the system was put in hibernation uh, was not is not saved when uh, as soon as the laptop is powered off 
So it will lose that flag and then the BIOS would think, oh, the system was not put in hibernation or something like that. Uh, so yeah, uh, the Toshiba Libretto. Um, it's quite a novel thing. It runs Windows 98 and I can run DOS games on it too. Uh, and this is actually the very last model that where you can actually still do it. The models immediately after this libretto, you can't do that anymore because they switched to Transmeta Crusoe's and were only really meant to run Windows XP Home or something. Uh, yeah, uh, so I don't actually use the libretto very o very often, uh, even for like DOS gaming because well, um, it's rather clunky to. Uh, or awkward to play games on it, especially like first build engine games like Duke 3D because of how small the keys are and it gets really tiring especially with the, when you always keep your fingers on the arrow keys uh, it gets tiring uh, being hunched, having your hands hunched up like that for uh, long periods and also I don't really play DOS games very much or games in general often uh, much nowadays because I usually just uh, either work on videos or work on pro programming projects but I do play play on it from time to time but I usually usually play with like desktop systems where I have like a full sized keyboard uh, it'd be kind of nifty to have around when you're like traveling so you would like play DOS games uh, uh, on the go uh, and it's more portable than like having a full size laptop uh, so if you can live with the tiny keyboard I guess it's not bad uh, and if you could rebuild the battery with like actually good uh, uh, battery cells instead of the rather crap goop ones I'm using so it would last longer uh, Toshiba specifies that the laptop would run for 3-4 hours uh, uh, with uh, with its original standard battery pack but mine only lasts like 2 hours or less which is not bad but uh, and for whatever reason, there's this thing about the battery pack where it seems to auto discharge itself. Uh, as you can see in like the in the, like the battery graph, there's like actually an estimated estimation of how many days the battery will hold a charge until it becomes completely drained. I don't know why it does that. I imagine that's just the nature of like early early like uh, lithium ion packs. Uh, uh, really, they have like a self-discharge mechanism for safety reasons or something, uh, softy reasons. And it doesn't happen when you unplug the battery pack from the libretto, though. So, um, yeah, um, I, I've yet to like. I would like to like repack the battery pack of my libretto with like proper 7670s, like these ones, because not only are these higher quality uh, battery cells, but these are the correct cell size for this battery pack, uh, 17670, which would allow me to put uh, the battery pack's cover back on now, because as you can see, the batteries are exposed, because uh, 186, because the 18650s are thicker, so uh, reason why I'd want to put the cover back on is so I could break, take this to like airports when I'm like traveling in vacations, and you know airports are assholes when it comes to air, to batteries, because assholes or maybe I'm the asshole, who knows, but, so yeah, um, I don't know, I think there's not much else uh, to go on about uh, this libretto, it's a nifty thing like I said, uh, it's a bit impractical because of how small it is in, at times, but I guess if you want to play DOS games on a go, uh, in a pinch, I guess it's not bad, if you can get it for real cheap, I got this one for just 200 pesos, uh, uh, from the same surplus t place I got my VX1000 from, uh, which is sadly no longer there now. They've closed, uh, sadly, and annoyingly enough, uh, because there were one, one of the few Japan surplus stores left that would still stock uh, electronics. The other surpluses I've seen so far, and including that my go-to one where I. Uh, found that giant uh, projection TV which is already sold some some doof was actually bought into that uh, 25,000 peso uh, projection TV uh, I imagine they don't feed it like proper full HD video signals they just feed composite because you know people are stupid uh, so yeah uh, they are they're starting to become reluctant with uh, purchasing you know with uh, stocking electronics now so Japan surplus is gonna become a bit boring for me in the 
near future I imagine because they stock small electronics but like computers not much at all uh, not much anymore uh, so yeah it's gonna suck it's gonna be less interesting now it could just be uh, deliveries have been slow for surpluses because of this stupid made in China pandemic so yeah, um, yeah the libretto I guess that's, there's that uh, all right, uh, now this video took so long to make because well, there were many factors getting in the way that were s severely uh, slowing this project down. Um, namely, um, mood. Uh, mainly, I just didn't feel like I'm just not in the mood to like work on a video for like a uh, few months for some reason, and I just ended up streaming for uh, quite some time. I streamed a bit too many, too many times uh, though. Uh, and then there's also this annoying uh, thing that happened uh, where Arch Linux dropped uh, the, the packages I need to, for my my Quadro 4000, uh, which is a video card on my workstation. Uh, because of course it, it's it, they dropped it because it's obsolete, and I'm supposed to be using the latest and greatest uh, video uh, computer hardware. Uh, fuck you! I don't have the budget to build a Ryzen 5 build or whatever modern system you could put together now uh, uh, this Z600 is a 24 thread monster it will rip your stupid budget uh, Ryzen 5 budget build a new one and, and this thing cost me about as much if not less than your stupid Ryzen 5 build so yeah um, suppose I, I plan to get at least a decade out of this it should have a lot of uh, uh, should I don't know it should last for quite a while because it's a th 24 thread monster uh, in fact you might you may have noticed in one of the clips uh, VX1000 on that ta on uh, on the corner of my on one of my tables uh, that's when I took it out uh, when I rolled back to an R5 240 and then there's also another thing where the version of Caden Live that's provided by Archbile Linux's uh, package servers is a really shit busted version that for some reason the you cannot seek around clips anymore, so you could like set a start and end point uh, to the video clip before you drop that region into your timeline. You can't do that in whatever version that was in Arch Linux anymore. Uh, so that broke the camel's back for me and uh, reformat my, reformatted my workstation to Debian, which is the, one of the least uh, annoying distros of uh, Linux that I'm aware of and I'm also more familiar with it. Uh, I don't know, thing, things under Debian seem to work a lot better than in Arch. Uh, on Arch, even when you manage to get things going, um, even if you manage to get an Arch system running, there's always something off about it. I, I, it may look like it's working fine, but it's, sometimes there's some just something off about it. Uh, I can't put my finger on what, but uh, I don't know. I'm just not comfortable with Arch anymore because... Um, well, it doesn't let me use my Quadro 4000 anymore. So, but and when while Debian still has like packages, driver uh, packages for my uh, that will work with my Quadro 4000 still. So, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, well, a minor annoyance when I switch to Debian is the K version of Kaden Live that's in, I think Buster is a bit, uh, it's a bit behind. It's missing like. Uh, key frameable. Uh, it miss, it's missing like opacity options, so I cannot polish up the the charts like fading in, fading out very, uh, much. Sadly, but I could probably just download a dead package from Caden Live's uh, website and then just install it. So that way, instead of just relying on uh, on uh, the package servers. So yeah, um, at least I finally got this video done. Uh, I'm glad to see the back of it, uh, to be honest. It was, just, it was a huge pain to get this video done, really, because of how long it's been. Go this project's been going on. Uh, I mean, I've started filming for this video since, like, February, when the stupid Chinesium pandemic was just uh, looming over. Uh, so yeah, and well, so much has changed now. Uh, I've accumulated a bunch of new things, uh, including this... Uh, camera I'm using to film this post video ram uh, post ramble thing, uh, which uh, that explains why it's now in widescreen by the way because this camera can actually film in widescreen. It's still in standard definition, but at least I can now make widescreen videos again. 
which is a bit of a step up. Uh, I'm still not gonna bother trying making videos with the LX7 anymore, even though it's high definition. Because fuck 50 FPS video, it causes more trouble than it's worth, to be honest. And unfortunately, I cannot get that Desk Pro uh, or compact desk noob with a missing front panel working, because the when I got that thing, that the thing is quite unique because it, it's the first system I've gotten that has like EISA slots and it's a backplane style system. Unfortunately, the power supply is busted on it. It had a blown uh, MOSFET, so I had to order a replacement from eBay. So, and that replacement took a long damn time to arrive because of this pandemic, uh, uh, causing my proxy to operate extra slow now. Uh, proxy I used to order stuff from the US, but it's been extra slow, and it took several months for that part to arrive. And then I plopped that replacement part back in. Only to get met by the good old... Nothing! Bro! Okay. Fucking nah, mate! Fucking hell! Well, it was a minor disc cap that blew up, but... Uh, uh, even after I removed that uh, disc cap, the power supply still doesn't work, so... Yeah, uh, annoying. Switch mode power supplies are... I guess they're made of sorcery. I guess I suppose I was lucky with getting the. Uh, I was able to fix a switch mode power supply uh, for a Sony VHS machine that got blown up from being plugged to 20 volts. Uh, I suppose I was lucky with that. So I thought same same problem with this one too, but not not the case apparently. I don't know. And it's annoying that uh, this desktop uses like a non-standard. It has its own proprietary power supply. That's the problem with OEM systems. They don't use standard components. If if this desk new port uh, system used the uh, uh, standard AT power supply, I could just grab one power supply from one of my other systems and then just plop it in. But uh, no, but no, it had to be a proprietary piece of shit, and I cannot find a replacement of uh, this particular power supply. Uh, this particular desk new is a series 3030, from what I can tell, with its. Uh, um, information sticker on the bottom uh, I don't know it's just a C series 3030 I don't know what type of compact uh, system it is exactly because the front panel is missing uh, it has a 486SX DX250 so it's not as good as a DX266 so yeah I, I don't know if I could get that thing running so, uh, as for this camera I'm using uh, it's a Sony DCR TRV at, a 20 digital handycam or candy ham. Um, it's it's new, a lot newer than the VX1000 from what I can tell. It uses DG8, but what? Uh, but it's still a DV camera. It records DV video, uh, but on D, D, on high 8 cassettes instead. Um, I might end up using this camera more for uh, future videos because not only is it widescreen. It's also a lot more convenient to use at times because, well, it's got an LCD that I can just flip uh, over, which makes, like I said, makes filming things like thing like these much easier. Uh, whereas on the VX1000, I had to break out like a, a small T, my small sharp uh, TV, or hook it up to my uh, Sony one next to me here that I use when I live stream the uh, console games. Uh, not only that. Um, it has working tape controls because on the v on my VX1000 it's it's broken. I could use a remote, but I don't know. Um, uh, the the imaging on this uh, camera is not as good as the VX1000 though. It's a single CCD. It's advertised as a precision CCD, but it still uh, exhibits like uh, rainbow artifacts and like very high detail shots. Uh, whereas on the VX1000 it does not. Uh, does not exhibit uh, rainbow artifacts at all because figures it's a triple CCD cam camera and uh, so yeah um, not only that it is also it's also got uh, nifty features you could use it like a actual you can actually use it like a video capture device uh, you could feed the video into its uh, outputs and it will actually display it on its LCD and and capture it as a DV stream from DireWire and uh, you could, or you could also rec you could record it to DG8, so you could use it like a like a, VC a portable VCR of sorts with a built-in screen, uh, almost like a video Walkman of sorts. So 
And also, the, I know I noticed DJ has is less prone to artifacts uh, than it is on the VX1000. So, uh, because as you've noticed in some of the clips, you notice there's like brief spurts of like random blocks appearing in in some of the clips. Well, that's this DV dropout. Uh, uh, well, figures DG8 is less prone to dropouts because it's using a much bigger tape format and it runs the tape faster, so it's more it's less to uh, prone to errors. Whereas in Mini DV, the tapes are much smaller. The data re recorded to it is much more, far more dense, and therefore it's uh, a bit less reliable. And even when I'm using like new tapes, it's still prone to like artifacts. So. Even when I just got the camera new uh, before I started using it extensively. So yeah, um, I forgot to mention. Oh yeah, the the Pervy Computer 98. Uh, yeah, I had that for a while. Unfortunately, I never got around to making a video of it uh, when it was still working fine. Uh, it wasn't up to snuff yet uh, when it comes to making videos of computers yet. Uh, I had much more fun with the libretto than that. Pervy Pewter 98, which I actually used to use in college, like I actually did some uh, paperwork on it, uh, especially as it came with like Windows 3.11 on it. Uh, and it's a shame it's busted now. It was kept in a drawer, but it looks like it, it was left outside being rained on, but no, I put it in a drawer. Uh, that's, that's what Pinayland humidity does to th old things, uh, the screens get rotten. And that's why I'm very reluctant of uh, buying like secondhand LCD monitors because they're often yellowed or misty colored, uh, like which has happened to my crappy Samsung monitor that I replaced my Diamondtron with when that mo Diamondtron was fa was was falling apart sadly. So it's now misty now. It's now a misty display. It's not as good as it was before. So, uh, yeah, it's stupid. That's why I don't like uh, calculator panels. I, and well, unfortunately, I feel I feel the same thing would happen on the libretto screen as well. The screen's gonna rot because well, it, it, it's sort of developing it a bit because the screen is a bit yellow now, uh, vinegar syndrome. Uh, but I have a feeling eventually it will become completely rotten, and then the laptop becomes unusable as a result. Yeah, that's and also that by the way the. Pervy pewter screen is like secreting some kind of weird liquid on it. it smells awful. It's quite. I. I, I don't think it's. Uh, I think it's quite toxic. Uh, to be honest, I've never seen a rotten screen secrete some kind of liquid though. Oh yeah, the pervy pewter. It wasn't really a fun thing. I had my fun with it uh, when it used to work fine. Um, not only did it suffer like screen rot, but it also had bad capacitors because the very last time I tried to power it on, the screen was flickering white and it would power off at random so yeah it's pretty much done for now and it wasn't really an interesting pervy pewter anyway because well it doesn't have the FM86 soundboard uh, doesn't have any sound hardware whatsoever so uh, I mostly pay, played Toho on it I never really got to play like the Henty titles for it uh, but uh, I wasn't really I was nah I don't know I was more into Toho on on that, uh, you, but I actually tried to install like Windows 95 on it, which would work in theory. Uh, PC 98 version of 95, obviously. Uh, I never got that to work, uh, just so I could play like Doom 95 to make it a little bit more useful. But uh, I should have known there was, I, sh I should have known there was actually a port of like Doom for like pervy computers. Uh, uh, so it'll be a bit more interesting to play, but still not as interesting because there's, like I said, there's no sound hardware. I had my fun with it. Uh, also, rotting LCDs. That's what I don't like about these computer shops selling like uh, secondhand uh, calculator panels because they're usually yellow. Why not stock a bunch of CRTs? Uh, they don't suffer from that problem. Oh, wait, no, people don't want CRTs because people want the crappy quality of uh, calculator panels. Have fun with your poor black levels and 5 millisecond latency, you morons. And also, especially those who are like stuck on 1366 by 768 screen, uh, resolutions, which is actually not that different from most CRT monitors that you they, that usually run at 1024 by 768. It's just a wide version of that resolution. So yeah, um, so yeah, um, 
Hey, that pervy pewter. Uh, I've only got to show it once uh, in this, on this channel, sadly. It was in that uh, video of um, a mysterious caves theme uh, displaying some artwork uh, that would fit with the music theme, I guess. Uh, with the theme, I guess. Uh, but by, by the time I shot that, uh, it already developed problems. A very co a problem I had with uh, pervy pewters. It's actually my second pervy pewter laptop, by the way. My fir very first one was like uh, one with a passive matrix screen and had a 486SX2 in it. This one was a DX2. I think it's a 50 megahertz one on both models. So yeah, the common problem I get with those is at some point when you try to press like the A key, it will also register the S key, so it renders typing on the DOS prompt impossible. And it happens on other keys too. V, I think it happens on V. You press V, it also press B. I imagine that's actually ca probably caused by de by aging capacitors. So. Also, I should add with uh, the delays on this video is also because I was working on uh, p uh, programming projects too uh, as well. Should have mentioned this earlier. Um, PS New Best DK. I've uh, added uh, multi-session CD-ROM support, uh, and I've also fixed uh, compatibility issues with PSIO, where it would just lock up on PSIO. I've also fixed the um, reset graph in it uh, routine uh, that 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 basic. Apparently, in some cases, when a new PS EXE that's just been loaded, the when execute and when program execution is transferred to that loaded PSEXC, sometimes interrupts are not disabled. So my so the reset graph routine now disables interrupts before it sets up its own interrupt handler, so it doesn't crash anymore on loaders. And not only that, I was also working on another uh, nifty thing called Nubrom, which is basically my own take on Kaitla. It's more developer oriented. Uh, 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 Feature-wise, it doesn't have a cheat system and memory card manager. Uh, you can upload PSEXEs uh, to it via either serial or Expo Explorer parallel port cable. Uh, I was gonna support uh, Pro Action Replay or Game Shark uh, par parallel interface, and uh, I even made like an adapter board for it. But I wasn't able to get that adapter board made uh, mostly because of my own stupidity. Because well, I did not know there's actually a it was actually, uh, I was actually gonna have it made by the bo uh, actually get the boards fab by JLC PCB, but because of my own stupidity, I, I wasn't really able to uh, get it made. Uh, and then when I figured it out, uh, pandemic happened because China, and I could no longer do it for a long while. Uh, I also have other electronic projects. Uh, so yeah, uh, Nubrom also has uh, no cache unlock and uh, easy swap trick. Uh, no cache unlock would only work on US and EU consoles, so it basically lets you boot uh, CDRs or read CDRs without needing to install a mod chip uh, on your console. Uh, uh, easy swap is meant mostly for like the Japanese consoles because they don't support that unlock uh, trick. Uh, and CD Audio actually works on uh, Nubrom's uh, easy swap feature because apparently the set session command can be used like a read talk uh, com uh, command, but it doesn't it doesn't uh, recheck the legitimacy of the disk. It, uh, if you issue a read talk it, and, and you've done the disk swap, it will clear the authentication status. If you do it with set session, it will just read the set update the session. Uh, the table of contents for of the disk when you just specify the first session and it doesn't clear the status so yeah you can boot like uh, backups copies bootlegs whatever you want to call it uh, with Nubrom on any system, basically. The only downside with the Easy Swap is you cannot do multi-session with it. So uh, I'm gonna cover, talk about Nubrom more. Uh, actually, Nubrom has been out for quite some time already, since I think April. Uh, it's been up updated extensively since then. Uh, I'm gonna talk more about Nubrom alongside the uh, 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 PS Nubes DK Roundup video that I'm gonna make in the future. Uh, uh, in the not so distant future, um, 
yes so yeah a roundup video and then I'll, I'll also double as a video about Nubrom um, Nubrom also supports like TTY uh, for both serial and explorer input and output so you could do console input stuff on it as well on the PS1 side so uh, which is something that wasn't really supported on Kaitla really so yeah and then there was also this other project that just came out of nowhere So yeah, I've been getting into MS-DOS uh, stuff uh, lately. Um, I actually quite like <laughs> developing for DOS again, uh, this time in my more matured state where I can actually write uh, assembly code now. Uh, especially now, once I've figured out how, how to uh, program for DOS, uh, like found good resources for, uh, thing, uh, for that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, that's some random magical girl thing, yeah. I, uh, it started out as a joke, uh, also as a proof of concept. Uh, see if the IBM PC can do, can actually do like uh, Japanese uh, bullet hell curtain fire shooting games. Uh, I, <laughs> more specifically, the PC-98 uh, Toho games. I even got the video mode down pat too, it runs in like 640x400 mode. And I even abused the VGA hardware quite extensively, namely the line compare register, so I could do like uh, hardware scrolling and uh, page flipping. There's just enough video memory when doing in 640 by 400 mode for just eight off-screen lines, uh, actually uh, ten uh, per page. So it's quite tight, and it exhibits some like bugs, scrolling bugs uh, when it's like going up, when it's scrolling like really fast. Um, it demands a Pentium 75, but I think it might run okay on a 486 uh, DX266, I haven't tested it. So yeah, and guess what I've used to develop, uh, pro uh, program that game on? Well, it's that Pentium Noob machine that I did a video uh, a long while ago. Uh, I'm using Open Wacom because it's free. And, and, yeah, uh, and of course the Pentium Noob machine. Uh, or Pentium Pro, if you don't catch my grip, drift runs uh, Windows NT 4.0, which is the way to go on how on using these uh, Pentium Pro systems. Uh, that's how, so yeah, this is basically how you use the Pentium new properly. You use it to do serious workstation work work stuff, uh, not not games and or using it as a as a glass case of uh, overpriced uh, cards that, and is barely functioning as a result. So. Uh, having multiple sound cards and of course 3DFX cards on uh, and need a Pentium Noob machine especially if it, it's an even bigger waste if it was an M SMP one with like two or four Pentium Noob processors on it so yeah some random magical girl thing uh, it's not really more it's not really uh, like uh, oh your P Perfect Computer 98 has curtain fire shooter games oh the IBM PC can do curtain fire shooter games too so fuck your comp fuck your airy jap uh, computer platform it isn't really like that it's more like uh, oh um, uh, oh that oh the perfect computer has like uh, jap shooter games oh the IBM PC can also do those types of games uh, as well so <laughs> yeah um, it's, this is actually kind of like a sort of like a parody piss take and love letter of like the total games uh, basically but featuring my uh, Western character designs instead with some weed designs here and there. I don't know. I quite like work, uh, working on this project to be honest. Uh, I think it's probably because it has my like my oldest long-running character in it, uh, which will play as. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't probably. It's also probably because I'm more comfortable with 2D stuff. Uh, one reason why I didn't really cut the two work on like Scarlet Engine. It was because they found it too overwhelming, namely the collision detection. I couldn't figure it out, so I just uh, put it on the wayside and then, and, and, and then ended up making PS Noob SDK instead, uh, which I think has a better, is more, is, I think better in the long term because well, it will allow for like uh, making homebrews without having to use Sony's SDK anymore. So yeah, and then I imagine a bunch of people would say. Dude, why are you making games for DOS? Make games for PS1. No one cares about DOS games. 
Oh, uh, sorry, but I, just, I don't know. This won't really be a long-term project. I just want, I won't, I won't really make it like a full game. I'd probably just make it like a one-level caravan-style shooter to basically show off that the PIBMP compatible PC can do a game like uh, the Total Games on PC98. And I'm also even writing like my own music engine for that thing that will take full advantage of 4-op music and uh, for op uh, synthesis of uh, OPL3. So, so yeah, I cannot u use AdLib Tracker 2 because I can't be bothered to get use trackers anymore. Uh, Cakewalk and piano roll sequencers uh, basically ruined it for me. And not only that, but getting four up uh, uh, sounds working in Adlib Tracker 2 is kind of awkward. It's as if it's just a hack the way it's implemented. So. Yeah, um, oh yeah, uh, I don't, I doubt anyone would be looking forward to some random magical girl thing. That might also be a hentai, uh, because figures people only seem to care about the console homebrew and not PC homebrew, right? Uh, uh, it's actually, I don't know, I don't think it can be classed as homebrew, maybe, I don't know, it's not a console, it's a p personal computer. Uh, so, yeah, um, I actually wouldn't mind making it like an actual hentai game, but uh, that would make the game less accessible for whatever reason, because people are afraid of seeing boobs for some reason. We would still have a bit of perviness to, that, to, to, some, to the game anyway, probably just their characters in like underwear or lingerie or something. Uh, more, more of a, it's pretty much a nod to like pervy, uh, PC-98 really where, because if you don't know, most of the games on PC-98s were hentai, so, so yeah, some random magical girl thing, uh, what else, oh yeah, that, uh, oh yeah, the, oh uh, yeah, Scarlet, uh, I actually put up uh, my old code base uh, for that, for, that was, that was used to make that, demo video of Scarlet Engine a long while ago. I'm not calling it Scarlet Engine because uh, Project Scarlet uh, is the code name for like uh, Xbox Series X or whatever it's called now. So yeah, Scarlet Engine, uh, yeah, I've actually put it up on my website now but I haven't made a page. I haven't got around to making a page for it yet. Uh, putting it up there even it's incomplete as mainly as a reference or you could like take some code from it as long as you like take uh, give credit where it is you if you don't credit well you're full of shit I guess uh, so yeah, I don't know I just don't feel comfortable doing 3D stuff yet I'm not yet experienced I wanna I wanna do DOS stuff in the meantime and that's 2D uh, in fact in fact it's a breath, good breath of fresh air to try out a new platform now because well, I've been programming for the PS1 for like what, seven, eight years or so. So yeah, I want to try out something new. I still have, I still plan to do some PS1 stuff uh, in the future. Obviously, I'm gonna continue working on PS Noob SDK. Uh, lately, I've been trying to get the M deck to work, but it's been beyond my comprehension at the moment because I don't know how uh, JPEGs work. I don't know how JPEG encode, Macrobot encoding works. It's basically like JPEG, but it has differences. Which are documented, but I just can't figure it out yet. Uh, uh, I might also might uh, work on the SPU library as well. Uh, maybe the Fart Maker music system. Uh, I think some. Of, I think I could, that would be a, a good thing because I could probably copy its logic and put it into whatever music s sequencer engine I'm gonna put into the SPU library for PS Nubestic in the future. So. Uh, yeah, sort of. It's sort of gonna hit, take uh, two birds with one stone. So I don't know. There's just so much shit to talk about. That's what happens when you're, when you've been, when it's been a long time since I've uh, made a video last, since I last made a video. So, uh, oh yeah, that my stupid crap server. Uh, well, it's gone now because well, everyone seems to be bored of it now. So, no point keeping it up anymore. And the obvious and well. Also, nobody seems to give a shit about my DOS stuff from what from what I observed, so it was just starting to irritate me. Uh, I'd rather just chat uh, through chat with people through on my live streams rather than through Discord for some reason. Uh, besides, I'm not supposed to be running a community of any kind. I'm supposed to be devoid of community, and I'm supposed to be making uh, 
uh, connections with other people uh, uh, because I've been told not to uh, with on the internet so and those people who told me I'm not supposed to like make connections are uh, pe people of not much significance uh, uh, in the first place so yeah um, and that's three years ago by the way or at least almost three years ago I don't know but, well, who cares uh, no one really wants to be around Nate Lane guy 64 anyway I'm quite awful to be honest uh, if this if the humor in his video was not apparent enough already so yeah I've, I don't really give a shit about going to town of making fun of practically everything including things that are not really supposed to be that are considered norm or or not generally not to be made fun of or something I don't care but I had loads of fun with making this video and anyway so yeah um what else yeah well if I really want to I could always make it again but most people seem to have gotten bored with it figures they probably found better better servers uh, later on when they became quiet my favorite type of my favorite favorite sort of people that I've observed there are ones that well, I noticed oh there's like a notification there's an, some twat has posted something new on my server for who knows how long and then I go there and then I found nothing I suspect it's it's some more some dorks that just came to my server out of curiosity and it found that it's a bit uh, dead and then they just left I like those type of people those are the best types of people to have in a community right so but anyway um, I don't know I so yeah what else um, I, so as for future videos um, as for future videos I'm gonna do either do a PS Noob SDK and Noob Run video or I'll do a video of my uh, or I'll do a music video of sorts uh, showcasing some of the songs I've made with the CC5000 uh, uh, so yeah, I actually love the I really love the CC5000 it's quite easy to use synthesizer I don't know why everyone many people seem to say oh CC5000 is very hard the DX7 is much harder to use and also the tape is uh, about to run out of my camcorder uh, damn it so yeah, either music, uh, CZ5000 music that I've cobbled together, and I'm, and I found the CZ5000 to be easy to use, and I'm just some knobhead who has very lim limited experience in music in the first place. Yet I can make music with the CZ5000. So, yeah, I, this post rambling has been going on for so long now. Uh, so yeah, if you want, I don't know, either PS no SDK or or CZ5000 video and I might also want to do like more computer videos I'm probably gonna do the Pentium Noob, Re Noob Revisit again uh, at some point uh, uh, for, uh, I'm gonna do the Pentium Noob first uh, when I get to do computer videos so yeah um, anyway uh, I hope you enjoyed this video I guess uh, leave a like or dislike or unsubscribe or do the opposite of those and I appreciate that more. So yeah, uh, Lingai64 is signing out and have a good day I guess. <laughs> that jingle takes me back. Yeah, anyone who can figure out where that's coming from, then props to you, I guess. <laughs>